Before we get started, hello everyone and welcome to today's OTS webinar series. Uh, today, our featured speaker is Dr. Karen O'Neill. She is the co founder and chief scientific officer of Aero Biotherapeutics. Uh, she has a really kind of vast experience in a bunch of different fields. Um, and today, she'll be talking about uh, muscle targeted siRNA conjugates for RNA disease. Uh, but she also has over 30 patents. So, if you have questions, um, I think they can be far ranging, uh, but we'll let her get started and take it from there. Thanks, Erin. I appreciate the, the introduction. Yeah, so I am uh, just by way of introduction, actually a protein engineer by training and, um, and started aerotherapeutics um, about uh, five and a half years ago now. Spent many years at J&J &J working on developing the technology that has ultimately become uh, part of Aero's portfolio. So I'm excited today to tell you about our LEAD program. And this is a program for Pompe disease. Uh, and we are actually very close. We are getting ready for our regulatory filing in the next couple of weeks. So pretty exciting to finally get to this point. So I'm gonna start out by um, introducing the technology um, to you, just for those of you who might not be familiar with this. And basically what we are doing is uh, using a small protein domain called Centurin uh, that and those are shown um, up here uh, in this, schema this schematic on the top. And we have a library of these domains. It's a very large library. And so we can select binders to lots of different targets. And the whole idea behind creating um, this sort of domain, uh, binding domain, uh, was to be able to have something that was much easier to work with, better behaved biophysically, and uh, then antibodies and, and worked really well for delivery sorts of applications. So these domains that we um, use called centurions are, do not have any disulfides. They're not glycosylated. Um, they are, we can identify very high affinity binders, basically exactly like you can for antibodies. But then we site specifically introduce the cysteine and we can attach the, uh, the, the whatever the payload is. And in this case, we're actually using um, oligonucleotide. So we have linked these via a, uh, a, a non-cleavable, um, chemically val clinically validated um, linker. Uh, and we link that to the, the sense strand of the siRNA. And so uh, we really focused on siRNA because there was, uh, you know, there had been a fair amount of progress in this field. We felt as though these were um, highly potent and um, obviously very um, specific, and uh, and we have a long PD effect. So a little bit more about the Centurions, just for those of you who uh, might not be familiar. Um, we create these binding sites, and that's illustrated um, by the orange uh, parts of this uh, ribbon diagram here on the left. Uh, we, have, we have libraries in the loops here, and we also have libraries that lie across the face of one of these sheets. So a lot of protein design engineering that went into these, and the whole idea was really to make something that was um, very, very stable, um, and even stable across a broad range of pHs. So the overall, the protein is about 10 kilodaltons, so about a 15th the size of an antibody. Um, they're antigen specific, um, high affinity. We also did quite a lot of work on immunogenicity, which I'll tell you um, a little bit about as we move on. Um, and because of the low molecular weight then of these, um, this domain compared to an antibody, the overall amount of drug that you need to give is, is quite a bit lower. Um, than you would give for a MAB or a FAB conjugate. Uh, we have now developed a really efficient um, and simplified manufacturing process, and we've completed all of the work um, to, for the GLP talks to enable our filing. So the, the receptor that we are um, applying for this, um, this particular drug is a, a CD1 binding centurion. So we call this CD1, it's the same as the transferrin, CD71, sorry, use that. We call that um, the same thing as the transferrin receptor. Uh, and we use CD71 um, simply to make it clear it's not binding to transferrin. 
So we're binding to this receptor and we're actually binding to the receptor in a fairly benign way. And I'll show you the data that supports that. But we wanted to <clears throat> use this receptor because it has been demonstrated um, to uh, be able to deliver nicely to the muscle. Um, this receptor has also been used for brain delivery, although the characteristics that one might use for such delivery are probably a little different than one might use for, um, for a muscle delivery. So we have now demonstrated in vivo POC for um, targeting, uh, using a CD71 to target uh, both muscle and immune cells. And I, I really will only touch on the, the immune cells as our sort of next generation um, technology. So how do we go about this? You know, there's multiple pieces. I will say that we have learned that each and every piece of this conjugate is very important. So both the um, centurin and the siRNA, but also the linker. And so it's really um, critical depending on the application that you want to um, use this for, to make sure that you're thinking and optimizing each piece of this. For the centurin part, we use a, um, a technology called SPITS display, which is basically an in vitro display technology uh, where the, um, the protein that is being expressed is um, attached to a piece of DNA that codes for it. And so it's fairly straightforward for us to then just go through um, and uh, cycle through rounds of selection to enrich for binders. So we'll first try to identify what that cell surface receptor is that we're looking for. And in this case, we use CD71. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, we do the, um, using our in vitro display technology that's called SIS display, we select for good binding, um, or I should say appropriate binding, the right binding for the application. Uh, the internalization properties, and we do that right in our early screens, um, as well as specificity. And then, um, you know, we can set up things where we look at natural, uh, whether these things compete with a natural ligand, if we do want that or we don't want that. And I'll tell you how we did that for CD71. Uh, we look at stability of these molecules. That's a really key feature for us. And, and we want to make sure that we've maintained the stability of the the parent um, starting scaffold. Uh, we look at immunogenicity and, and sometimes we have to remove potential T cell epitopes, but overall um, the, the, the scaffold itself is quite um, non-immunogenic in all in vitro um, as well as so far in in vivo um, experiments. And then of course we get to the scale up part and there's many um, advantages for the scale up and manufacturing of these molecules uh, because they can be expressed in E. coli in the soluble fraction. And so that just makes it very easy for us in the lab to look at hundreds of these molecules and not try to adapt, um, engineer the molecule for good delivery, but actually let the molecule um, dependent on its epitope, its affinity and its biophysical characteristics really tell us which one is the right one. Um, for the siRNA discovery, we've now established this in-house also at Arrow, um, and we, you know, have, we select that that target gene. We'll do in silico screening, and again, we've we've set this all up in-house now um, at Arrow, uh, and we can do um, and we screen for in vitro potency. So we'll make roughly 150, 200 oligos, screen those, and and call them down to a set that looks really um, important. And we'll, we'll do then RNA-seq um, experiments to look at specificity. And I'll, I'll show you some of that data as well for our lead molecule. And then ultimately we'll look at um, you know, potency, stability, and preliminary um, toxicity. So in terms of the, the um, conjugation uh, between the centurin uh, and the siRNA, um, as I mentioned, we are using a, uh, a, a validated linker, something that has actually been used in the clinic more for ADCs than for siRNAs potentially, but nevertheless, uh, we conjugate via um, a malayamid um, linkage and we open that, that ring uh, once it's coupled to make sure that we have a very stable molecule. 
The really significant advantage of this is it allows us to very simply purify um, these for unreacted siRNA or, or unreacted centurin and to, as shown down here um, in this, uh, the size exclusion chromatography, what we get is of uh, an oligocentirin ratio of one. So the only real possibility is to couple between this um, free thiol on the centurin uh, and the malayamid. And so it's very simple for us to maintain that, um, that OCR of one and that we get um, a basically um, completely homogeneous um, molecule by size, uh, by both size exclusion and mass spec. So in terms of um, looking at specificity, we pretty much always do these RNA-seq experiments once we get down to a handful. Uh, and so um, this is a, an, a, a molecule from one of the, from our lead program um, that has a really nice um, RNA-seq uh, specificity profile. So you can see up here in the left is a target gene. Guessing you're all pretty familiar with volcano plots where we're looking at the fold change on the x-axis and the uh, and the sort of probability here on the y-axis. In contrast, one of the other genes that looked fairly potent uh, when we took it into an RNA seq experiment, we um, we saw that it was actually uh, not uh, terribly specific. There were other genes that were downregulated um, at least as much, if not more than a target gene, um, which I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about as we um, get into the program. Uh, and then, um, but there's also things that um, have a you know, fairly similar um, amount of knockdown. So the other assay that we used was we really wanted to be able to show that our um, centurions um, were not having a significant impact on the receptor biology. And so, CD71's normal function is to, is to transfer uh, transferrin in, and iron inside of the cell. And so what we did was we set up an assay where we um, looked at um, transferrin that had been um, proto, we call it proto-labeled, so rhodamine labeled, and it's a pH sensitive um, rhodamine dye. And so as that uh, transferrin is internalized, you see an increase um, in signal. And so uh, just shown uh, in the pink dots here on this bottom graph, what you see is a, a really nice increase in, um, in signal. And that's a measure of the transferrin going into the cell. And so down in the bottom, basically running along the X axis in the solid blue line is what we get in the, when there is no transferrin. So no, uh, no increase in signal. We have looked at, um, we have initially selected some centurions that were truly competitive with CD71. And that's shown in the dotted blue line here. And you can see that basically we shut down all um, signaling uh, through that transferrin receptor. But if we look at other centurions, such as those shown in the orange and the green lines here, we can, um, we can show that they really don't compete with the natural internalization um, of, of uh, of transferrin. So just a, a comment about our in vitro display technology um, up here on the right. So just we, what we do is we're able to set up our screen so we can identify the kinds of centurions that, we, that we're really looking for. So we use selective uh, um, elution strategies. For example, if we're looking for something that's really high affinity, we can do an off rate selection select for those things that have a low, um, a very slow off rate. Um, we also can look for things that are alluded pH in a pH dependent fashion. We can look for competitive binders. We can even look for things that bind to specific epitopes um, with some um, creative strategies um, in that, in, during that selection. And that's a really nice feature of this in vitro display technology is really the ability to manipulate um, the selection. We always get asked about immunogenicity and so um, and specificity. So I'll show you that we did experiments on our lead CD71 Centurion with a company called Integral Molecular. For those of you who might not be familiar with Integral, they basically have um, a large set of avian cell lines, each of which expresses um, one human receptor. 
And so that human receptor basically constitutes the, the total membrane proteome array from um, the human uh, proteome. Uh, and so what we did was we looked at our um, lead CD71, and I, I circle it up here in orange to show you the blue dot. This is actually a real dot, um, and it's the data point on the CD71 receptor. So all of the other binding is, is down here around background level. Uh, and if we look at the, the siRNA attached to the CD71, we see pretty much exactly the same thing. Again, very, very low background binding to any other um, human receptor, but lots of um, binding to CD71. And then looking at um, immunogenicity, we worked with a company called Proimmune. They basically can do a, a T cell activation assay where they take PBMC samples um, that have um, a representative um, HLA haplotype that represents the, the human population and so, or the global population. And so the T cell activation is assessed after seven days. Um, and we looked at both the lead CD71 centurin and the lead centurin siRNA. So on the top are two um, positive control, tetanus toxin and KLH. And you can see that in, in this assay, these have response indices that are um, well above one. Um, I'll just say that this response index pro, um, range goes from zero to 100. And so um, most um, approved biologics have a, a response index value somewhere between zero and one. Um, and you can see that both the lead CD71 centurion and with the siRNA on it um, have a very low um, response index. Okay, so just sort of in, in um, finishing up here on what are the sort of unique attributes of centurions that allow them to be really good molecules for um, S or oligonucleotide delivery. Um, uh, uh, coming back again to the size, so if we, in, in this experiment, we dose the same amount of siRNA, it's actually a 10 megs per kg dose of siRNA, um, and we used a CD71 centurion or we used a CD71 antibody, um, and we looked at uh, we looked at knockdown, and this is two weeks post a single dose. We can see a really um, compelling knockdown um, in both cases, pretty much the same. Um, but if you look at the actual amount of conjugate that you dose, this turns out to be 18 mg per kg of conjugate because the centurion is actually smaller than the siRNA. Um, but in the case of the antibody, it's actually 120 mg per kg. So if you think about that of having to dose at um, you know, several milligrams per kg of siRNA in a person, um, that this can end up being pretty substantial amounts of protein that you end up having to dose for each dose. In terms of um, just the re reviewing the CMC um, attributes and the, the, the advantages of centurions is that we can have really high expression of these centurions in E. coli. We can get up to three or four grams per liter um, purified now in a, um, in a biofermenter. Uh, and so really um, nice high expression. Uh, that's all in the soluble fraction. So it's fairly a fairly straightforward recovery process. And we can do um, site specific conjugation has now um, been done at scale so that we have that homogeneous product and, and we're working on developing um, subcutaneous formulation. So let me move now and introduce you to the, the program. So we're working on Pompe disease. So Pompe disease is a, a rare um, neuromuscular disorder where the patients actually have loss of function mutations in an enzyme called acid alpha glucosidase, um, otherwise known as GAA. And so what happens is um, in these patients, they don't have the ability to break, break down glycogen that is in their, um, in their muscles. So glucose is taken up by the muscles that's usually um, uh, then, then uh, stored as glycogen. Um, and that glycogen is then broken down when it's needed to provide glucose using this enzyme GAA. And so what happens in these patients is that instead of having this normal healthy muscle like shown here on the left, 
they get these large um, lysosomes that are filled up with, with glycogen. And these patients experience progressive muscle weakness, uh, a loss of mobility. They, they, your diaphragm is actually um, also a muscle. So many of them have respiratory distress and, and lose the ability to independently ventilate. Um, and there are two forms of this disease. And in the infant form, cardiomyopathy is also um, a significant um, um, issue in those patients. So there are approved therapies that are out there. Um, they all basically are versions of this recombinant enzyme, the recombinant human acid alpha glucosidase, um, otherwise known as enzyme replacement therapy. They're given um, up approximately every two weeks. Um, and it requires a four to six hour IV infusion. And the other thing that is um, interesting about this is that there's limited and waning efficacy um, of the ERTs um, for a couple of reasons, but one of the key ones being immunogenicity. Um, and again, there's a lot of reasons why we believe that the immunogenicity um, happens, but nevertheless it does. And so when we're talking to doctors, they're telling us that after um, a couple of years, the, the efficacy seems to really drop for patients that are on these enzyme replacement therapies. And of course, these are also incredibly inconvenient. If you think about going in every other week for a four to six hour infusion, um, that is um, also um, a significant disadvantage or challenge for many of the patients. So we are um, coming at this a little bit differently. So over in the left panel here is kind of what happens um, normally um, in, um, in, in people that have normal uh, uh, glycogen metabolism in, in the muscle. And so what happens is the glucose is taken up. It, there's an enzyme called GIS1, glycogen synthase uh, 1, which is um, involved in uh, making polymers of, of glucose into glycogen, and that glycogen is stored then in the lysosomes. And when it's needed, the enzyme GAA comes in uh, and breaks it down into glucose. And so we see um, that um, in the in Pompe disease, these patients, of course, have um, some defect in GAA, and I would say they have reduced GAA function. Um, it, it's, it's rarely zero but it certainly can be anywhere between zero and say 40%. Um, and it usually um, has a real impact on that toxic, toxic glycogen buildup. So what we thought is that because this recombinant GAA is um, challenging for a lot of um, biophysical reasons um, to deliver, we thought, okay, well, what if we slow down glucose production? So we, we or sorry, glycogen production. So we um, would deliver uh, an siRNA that would decrease glycogen synthesis um, and thereby return sort of normal um, homeostasis to the, the glycogen levels in these, um, in these patients. So the first thing we did and we do for each of our programs is really look at genetics to, to confirm the, the role of the, the target gene and make sure that, that in fact, this seems like it would be um, a, a good target. Uh, we, we use um, various genetic databases and, and we've been able to um, show nicely that, those, um, that this, this gene is important and that in fact, um, knocking down the activity of this gene is likely to have a real benefit. Um, and so uh, we, we use that to you know, sort of validate our approach initially. We then have done um, studies in Pompeii mice. So there are mice that are um, available uh, where, you, where um, the GAA enzyme has been knocked out. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, and then we also do um, studies in myoblast. Um, and then there's some early clinical evidence now um, from a company called Maze Therapeutics that is delivering a, um, a small molecule inhibitor uh, of maize. I'm sorry, of, um, of uh, just one. So this is our, our lead molecule then. It is, consists of a CD71 binding centurant. Um, and again, I, we did all of the characterization work to ensure that this um, 
This zentirin does not interfere with sort of normal receptor function and uptake of transferrin. Um, as I mentioned, we're using a non-cleavable linker here. And then we have a, an siRNA that targets just one. Um, and we've been able to show that we have a, a really nice um, penetration into the muscles and that this, there's a very long, um, a very durable effect here. And so we are hoping that the, what this will do is we'll have a um, convenient and potentially enhanced safety profile. And we have our first in study planned before the end of this year. So we're getting very close to filing um, the regulatory documents. So a little bit of the preclinical data that we have used to um, validate this. So we are using a GAA knockout mouse. Um, and this is sort of tricky when you're doing biologics because um, for, for the, the um, targeting part of this, uh, because um, not only does the siRNA need to be work in the mouse, but now the centurion part of it, the targeting part needs to work in the mouse. So we uh, have a, a surrogate molecule that binds to the, the murine receptor, um, and we've been able to show nice uptake and delivery in those um, mouse cells. So the, that, that conjugate um, uses a surrogate centurion and also a surrogate siRNA, again, because of the specificity of those things for their, their human, um, human targets. And so that's, that's challenging in these kinds of animal models. So the, the, um, the idea is that um, the just one siRNA will induce cleavage of the just one mRNA. And we can, do, we can um, evaluate that by quantifying the full length just mRNA in the target cells. Um, and this ultimately leads to a reduction of just one protein and a reduction of just one activity. And we can monitor both of those things. Um, and that ultimately leads to a reduction in lysosomal glycogen. And we can monitor that as well. And then the, uh, the hypothesis, um, which has largely been um, validated now, is that that reduction in lysosomal glycogen will lead to a functional improvement. And that might be an improvement in mobility um, that one could measure or improving in improvement in breathing, improvement in activity level, um, things like that. And so we are um, also working on those kinds of um, readouts at this point. So first thing we needed to do was to demonstrate that our um, centurion targeted just one siRNA conjugate um, dose dependently uh, reduces both mRNA and protein for just one. And so the way that we did this was we went into these Pompeii mice and we gave a single dose. Um, and and this, in this particular experiment, we actually looked four weeks later. Um, and you can see a very nice dose dependent um, decrease in the mRNA. Y axis here is mRNA, X axis is the dose. Um, and you can see at, at the uh, the IC50 is, is roughly somewhere between one and three um, megs per kg, um, and, and that this is actually retained for a long time. So note, this is four weeks um, after we dose. So this is important because the PK um, of the centurion siRNA conjugate itself is actually um, very short. So in systemic circulation, the, the PK, the, the conjugate clears probably within about 30 uh, with a half-life of about 30 minutes. So very, very fast clearance. And yet in the tissues, we're seeing a prolonged um, retention um, of the pharmacodynamics. And um, we now have data to show that basically we can measure that siRNA for a fairly long period of time in those tissues as well. So now if we look at the, the protein, so this is the next step down, we can also see um, a very nice effect on protein and even probably um, a slightly more um, compelling effect on the protein levels than on the, uh, than on the mRNA level. Uh, and then we wanted to look at, um, at glycogen. And so our feeling is that in these mice, they actually have a very large buildup of that toxic glycogen. And so they don't really have a, um, a great efficient mechanism um, to, to break that glycogen down because they're, um, they're using um, 
they don't have any GAA enzyme. And so um, what we what we uh, what we knew was that we were going to have the dose for a fairly long period of time. The only way to get rid of that um, glycogen um, is to actually uh, that pre-existing glycogen is to uh, is is a phosphorylase that's involved um, in in degradation, but it's it's a very slow and inefficient process. So we knew we were going to have the dose for a pretty um, substantial period of time in order to see how that shutdown of the enzyme um, ultimate of, for formation of glycogen ultimately leads to a reduction in, in glycogen. And so in this experiment, we dosed once a month um, for um, four times. And then six weeks later, we actually took um, harvested the, the tissues from these animals and again, we looked at the, the mRNA and we can see um, very compelling knockdown. Interesting to point out um, that the, we do not see knockdown um, in the liver. And we have done this in many experiments now and shown that we really have no, no impact on the liver using our CD71 centurin for delivery. That's not to say that there's not a lot of this um, drug in the liver. There actually is um, when we've done sort of limited biodistribution studies. There's a fair amount in the liver, but it doesn't um, have the the um, the um, activity that this molecule does in various other tissues. And then if we look at glycogen, um, we are now starting to see a nice reduction on, in of that glycogen in um, a variety of muscles. Um, you'll probably notice that a there's no effect in the liver, which we would expect. Um, given that we don't see um, knockdown of the uh, mRNA in the liver. Um, but we also see that it's less effective in the heart. Um, and overall, this has held out in multiple studies that we've done now. Um, it does ultimately break down in the heart, but it is a much lower um, breakdown of that glycogen. We, um, we believe it's because the heart um, glycogen may well be structurally different um, than some of the other, um, than the glycogen and some of the other tissues. And so it takes a bit longer to knock down. So just in terms of our um, clinical um, plan and our, our, you know, our moving this forward, we actually went, then went into non-human primates um, and we took uh, three different doses, uh, what we call a low dose, a medium dose and a high dose. And again, um, we see a very nice dose dependent decrease um, in a variety of tissues now in these non-human primates. Um, and we see, um, that no, we, we saw no adverse safety findings. We basically had no um, AEs, we had no abnormal labs, um, and all of the ECGs um, were normal um, over the course of the experiment. Um, and then um, the histopathology findings were also good. We did this experiment just to um, point out, um, we dosed it zero, two, four, and six weeks. So again, four doses every two weeks. Um, and again, we don't see much effect here in the liver um, or the kidney in the NHPs as well. So um, overall then, um, this molecule just hopefully I, I've shared with you that we have really highly specific um, binding to CD71. Uh, we have very efficient conjugation. The conjugation efficiency uh, for this process is over 90% now. Um, in, and that is um, really helpful for the manufacturing. Um, we've achieved muscle um, specific in vivo gene knockdown with a durable effect with with no effect in the liver or the kidney. And, and ultimately this allows us to have no um, adverse, uh, supports the no adverse safety findings. We've completed our GMP manufacturing and we recently got orphan drug um, designation and rare pediatric um, drug designation. Uh, and so we anticipate being in the inpatients um, in the next, um, the next month or two. So I'll just sort of leave you with the idea that um, we're, you know, very excited about this lead program, but we're building out the, the Arrow pipeline now. Um, and we're very interested in using some of the CD71 centurions that we have identified that have somewhat different properties than the lead molecule potentially 
um, for uh, looking for CNS delivery. So there's a lot of data out there that suggests that, that um, CD71 can efficiently um, be used to de deliver um, things to the CNS. Uh, and one of the beauties of, of the Centurion technology is that we identify large panels of binders and we can sort of group these based on various characteristics and, and look at them for their utility in various delivery applications. Um, we've, 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 I've shared with you the, the muscle targeting, but the, the next frontier that we're really uh, working on is, is immune cells. And we're, we, we are looking at multiple receptors um, and we have some really nice data that I'm hoping to be able to share soon, but we're, we're focused on both validated um, targets in the um, immunology space. So we have a lot of expertise in, immuno in immunology on our team. Um, and so we have really uh, focused on those sorts of targets where we think there are new um, and undruggable gene targets, and there are many of those. Um, and we've identified siRNA leads for several of these now, um, both from a murine surrogate perspective as well as a human clinical lead. Um, and we also have several different centurions with different specificities um, under investigation. So not just CD71, but we're also looking at other immune receptors there. Um, and we've now been able to demonstrate um, siRNA mediated gene knockdown. In, and functional activity um, in both primary human immune cells and um, various mouth models for um, immune diseases. So we're really excited um, about this immunology uh, work and lo really looking forward to being able to present it sometime in the next couple of months. So with that, I will thank you and thank the team. Um, we have a, a great team of scientists, our labs are we have new labs located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and we're, um, we're building out our team, continue to build our capabilities and uh, looking to get this molecule into the clinic very soon. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Karen. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, very interesting overview. So uh, before I start uh, with the Q&A, because I see there are quite some questions in the Q&A, uh, I did my PhD in, uh, in Rotterdam at the Erasmus Medical Center. And actually there, uh, uh, Dr. Arnold Roser, uh, he was the one who invented the enzyme, enzyme replacement uh, therapy. So he did a lot of research on the uh, pompa disease. And, uh, yeah, so... That's interesting. So the um, the amicus group was actually in the lab upstairs from us before we just moved. So we're we're pretty familiar with all of the work on the enzyme replacement therapy, and um, you know, obviously it's had a huge impact on on these patients. Um, but there is still unmet need that we hope to be able to address with ABX eleven hundred. Yeah, no, fully fully agree on this. So maybe to to follow up. So so. Um, I think uh, in pompa disease you have uh, many many uh, different uh, mutations. And I think the most prominent mutation is an uh, intronic mutation uh, causing uh, splice deficits. I think uh, exon 2 is uh, spliced out. So uh, I think uh, their strategy is a slightly different strategy. So they are trying to uh, uh, splice in exon 2 again. So can you, can you compare the two different strategies and what are the pros and cons from uh, both uh, strategies? Yeah, you know, I still think that there's, you know, obstacles for gene therapy, mostly related to the um, complexity of, of that um, and, and that delivery. Um, I still think that having something that is really um, uh, good for delivery is going to be a really important piece of that and specific for that, that delivery. So I'm not actually completely familiar with that splice therapy. Are they delivering an oligonucleotide or are they delivering something? How, how is that being delivered? Oh, yeah. So I only know from their work in um, cell and animal models. And they're just, uh, so this is just uh, all preclinical work, of course. Uh, I see. I see. So, you know, some of the challenges with GAA are that that enzyme has actually evolved to work really well in the lysosome. So it, it's, the lysosome, of course, is much lower pH. And so this, this, when you dose this molecule, it's being dosed at sort of neutral pH, 7, 7.4. 
Um, and that, that has to travel through the systemic circulation and get to the, the place where it needs to go and the muscle. And, and then it actually, inside the muscle, it actually has to get to the lysosome. Um, and so there's just many steps in that process that where it loses efficiency. And so even gene therapies where they're trying to deliver, say, the recombinant human GAA gene um, are going to have to go through that process because it's still going to get expressed and it's going to have to go out into the um, normal pH um, mayu of the, of the bloodstream. Um, and so we're not absolutely convinced that those are really going to change the paradigm a whole lot in terms of potential immunogenicity profile um, and that sort of thing. No, no, I really agree on that. Uh, maybe one last question from my side. Um, so uh, I think there's also, uh, for example, a CNS uh, involvement in the uh, pompa disease. So I think your strategy now mostly focuses on the delivery into the muscle. Um, so um, is it possible to combine these strategies so to use another approach to also treat the brain at the same time uh yeah you probably been, must have been listening in our conversations at arrow over the last several weeks we've we've definitely been thinking about this and we we definitely um we we don't know to be completely honest with you right now whether whether this molecule gets into the brain um uh we are thinking about doing those experiments and um and, and what that might mean. Um, it, it could be a real benefit, um, but, um, and, and I will say that what we did in our toxicology experiments was we, we did look to make sure there were no adverse events in the brain. And, and there, that, that was the case. There were no adverse events, no abnormal histopathology or anything like that. But that being said, we don't really know whether this molecule gets into the brain and we recognize that there could be some nice advantages if it does. Then I'm going to the chat. Uh, first question from uh, Hassan. Uh, so is your uh, also that follows a bit uh, my question about uh, about the brain. Uh, uh, is your targeting moiety against transferrin receptor specific to uh, TFR1 or TFR2 or both? TFR1. Uh, and do you have TFR1? Okay. And second question is: uh, Do you have bio distribution to other organs or cell types? Yeah, so we've now um, we've now been able to measure tissue concentrations in a number of different organs. We have not done a complete biodistribution study, but we have looked at a number of different tissues, um, which is why we don't know if it gets to the, the CNS. We know there's a lot in the liver. We know there's a lot in the kidney. Um, and then there's some in these various um, tissues, uh, muscle tissues that, that um, are affected uh, and show knockdown. A uh, question from Bruce. Uh, a common feature of pompa patients with significant pathology is cytoplasmic glycogen coming from burst lysosomes. Do you expect to see evidence of clearance of glycogen in the cytoplasm? Well, so there is a, an enzyme that does um, degrade that glycogen. It's a, it's a, it's a phosphorylase. It's, it's very inefficient and slow. Um, and so I... I think that what we will see is that, that that will ultimately be cleared by that enzyme. And if there's no new glycogen forming, then um, we expect to see the benefits. So I, I don't have any real illusions that this is going to reverse disease. Um, what I hope is that we can stop the disease. And, and for that reason, you know, we're trying to um, work through strategies where we can get into early diagnosed patients much earlier um, so that we can uh, ho hopefully have an impact before they have had a, a significant amount of muscle damage. Um, we're helped along that path by um, newborn screening, which is now um, in about 50% of US states. I'm not sure how common it is in Europe or other parts of the world yet, um, but that we're seeing that you're um, first of all, the, the prevalence is increasing. There are, in fact, a lot more patients out there than we thought. Um, and what we're learning from talking to patients is that it's hard to, um, they, they have a hard time getting diagnosed. And so if, if you know at birth that you have this potential and you start having symptoms, um, we believe they'll, they'll really be um, an ability to interfere earlier and really change the course of that disease.
Yeah, I, I don't know how it is in other countries, uh, but of course, I think a newborn screening only makes sense when there is a therapy uh, present, right? It's amazing that um, I think that it only makes sense, but it doesn't. Politics doesn't always seem to work that way. <laughs> true, true. Good uh, question from Sandrine. Uh, is GIS1 expressed in all the tissues and muscles? Uh, and I think then the, maybe even more uh, important question, uh, what will be the impact from a safety point of view? Right. So the enzyme that is responsible for regulating glucose homeostasis in, um, in, in systemically is, the, is the, another isoform of this enzyme, it's called GIS2. Um, and it's found predominantly in the liver. Um, and so um, we don't have, expect to have an impact on um, glucose because we have demonstrated that our siRNA has no impact on GIS2. So this is, is a very specific um, siRNA uh, and it's very specific for GIS1 which is um, active primarily in the muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Um, and there is also some activity in the brain. So um, we've looked at all of those tissues for tox um, at really high doses, which is what the regulatory authorities made us do. Um, and we haven't seen any evidence for tox, but those are certainly things we'll be looking for. Okay. Uh, question for Mark. Uh, are the mouse surrogate siRNA and mouse centurion of equal potency to the human lead candidates? Yeah, that is a very good question. And the answer to that is yes. And it's something that, um, you know, we kind of learned along the way. We, um, we initially thought we would be able to find something or we would look for something that was reactive uh, against both human and mouse. Um, and finally, we decided that we'd basically be compromising on both of those. And so we focused our efforts on finding something that worked really well on the mouse and worked and something different potentially that worked really well on the human. And so we have two different siRNAs um, and they work equally um, well on their targets, um, but they're, diff they're unique from one another. Okay, sounds good. Uh, question from John. Uh, for the uh, PKPD in mice, uh, was muscle that was not injected into, into tested for the mRNA levels, or was it just the same muscle that received the dose? Uh, was it IP or IV? Um, I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that one? Yeah, I also have to read it for myself. Uh, <laughs> What was the control tissue? I think that is the question. And was the delivery uh, an IP injection or an IV injection? Yeah, so all of our um, mouse studies and NHP studies to date have been IV. Um, and we are planning to go IV into the clinic. Um, we, um, we're working on a sub-Q formulation. We've done some early work to suggest that, that, that um, sub-Q is going to work. Um, uh, and 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 the solubility properties of the the centurion conjugates is such that we really believe we'll be able to make a sub Q formulation. We can concentrate them um, quite a lot without an impact on viscosity or anything like that. Um, and so um, anyway, so so that was the answer to the question on the 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 method of dosing. Um, the control tissues, I guess, I would say the. We've also done um, in most of these experiments um, uh, a negative, a scrambled control siRNA. Uh, and so uh, when we publish this, that, that will be in there. But um, basically we see no effect of that scrambled siRNA. So that's one sort of control. And then in other tissues where we don't see uptake, even though the gene target gene is expressed in that tissue, we we can see that we don't get uptake into those into those tissues. Okay, uh, another question from Hassan. Uh, what is the low dose in the non-human primates? In the non-human primates, I believe the low dose was fifty mg per kg, um, and that's fifty mg per kg of conjugate. Okay, and a question uh, from Xiao Yang. Uh, curious how to quantify your centurion as iRNA. Uh, read OD at 260, 260 or 280? Question that mark. is an excellent question and one that I can't believe how much time I've spent um, working on. 
So we actually de um, de determined an extinction coefficient at 260. So we did amino acid analysis and we're able to get a really excellent extinction coefficient at 260. Okay, an important question. I think you just touched upon it uh, from William. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, what is the vehicle group? Is it a scrambled or is it a... Uh, yeah, just... in, in most of the data that I showed today, the vehicle group is literally um, PBS or buffer. Um, we actually use HBS, but um, and uh, in... Um, it, but in many of the experiments, we also use a scrambled control. We've also done experiments, I, again, these are things we did early on that I didn't include here today, but we've also done experiments where we looked at just the centurin, just the siRNA, and then the, the combination. Yeah. Uh, 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 let's see. Um... Uh, what were the size of uh, delivery in the non-human primate experiments? Uh, and how well does the drug distribute from the site? It's an IV delivery. No, the uh, intramuscular delivery. Oh, we didn't do intramuscular. We only did IV. Oh, yeah. That is true. That's, uh, okay, uh, then we go for the uh, IV question. Uh, you mentioned that the IV half-life of centurion as RNA conjugates is about uh, 30 minutes. As, so do you see an improvement in PK when using uh, subcutaneous dosing? When Would you use... What? Subcutaneous. When you, when you, oh. Um, yeah, you know that the profile is quite different in that you get um, a longer PK because it slowly gets into the bloodstream, but you also get a dampening of the CMAX. So, you know, we're working through some of that and, and trying to figure out what is the really critical feature for, um, you know, for activity, for the best potency. Uh, okay, uh, so... Uh... Question from Astrid. Uh, so this approach could also work for other uh, glycogenesis, uh, such as uh, myocardial disease. So have you tested this approach in other mouse models, for example, for this particular disease? Yeah, so um, it's it's interesting. The, the enzyme replacement therapies in some of those diseases are actually more um, effective, shall we say, than they are in Pompeii disease. And so we have not focused on, on those. This particular, um, this particular drug, uh, or ju just one, is not active in McCardle. It is not the relevant one. You'd need, you'd need to use something different for that. Um, and it's, it's not a, a current plan. Okay. Uh, question from uh, Guizhi. Is the Pompa mouse model commercially available? Uh, and how good does this mouse model resemble the human disease? Well, that is an excellent question. So the e first part's easy, they are commercially available. The second part is that they most um, resemble, I would say, infant onset Pompeii disease um, because these mice, are, these mice are born without any enzyme activity. And so they very, very quickly start accumulating glycogen and they really start accumulating glycogen in their heart. Nevertheless, they do have um, a lot of the muscle symptoms. They become less, um, they, be they become uh, less mobile. They become um, less able to walk, you know, get on the treadmill and go for long distances. Um, we're, we're in the process of doing a study in collaboration with Bart Pedersen. That's a, a longitudinal study and it's, it's, a, it's a nine month study. Um, and we're starting to see some really interesting um, and compelling effects there. And I, I'm really looking forward to being able to share that sometime in the near future. Cool. Uh, then we go back to the to the brain. Question from Vincent. Uh, could you elaborate about the different uh, CD71s targeting uh, ligands, ligand properties required for either delivering into the muscle or crossing the broad brain, broad, blood brain barrier? Yeah. So... We've looked at lots of different CD71s for delivery into muscle. Um, and I would say that in our experience suggests that for centurions, having a high affinity binder 
um, for delivery into muscle is really important. Um, I think for the CNS, uh, there's been quite a bit published that suggests that maybe having something that has a faster off rate um, is actually important for get it, being able to deliver and drop off that payload. So do transcytosis um, in, in, in the, across the blood brain barrier. Um, again, we, we have this nice panel um, of things that have different affinities and different off rates mostly. Um, and that we're planning to look and see which ones get into the brain most efficiently. It is. Thanks. Question from Lynn. Uh, great talk. Uh, what are the patterns of chemical modifications used in your SI RNA? Uh, what do you estimate for frequency of human dosing of your lead molecule? Okay, two great questions. So um, the first one is that we're using fully uh, modified SI RNAs. We have um, a couple of phosphothioates, I think there's six in the sort of spots that you might expect. Um, and then everything else is a, a fair amount of two prime O methyl and a little bit of two prime fluoro. Um, so um, that is, um, you know, all sort of more standard sorts of chemistry. We have not um, used any novel chemistry for, for this molecule. In terms of dosing, we actually have data that indicates that these um, molecules last out to like 50% knockdown, even out to 12 weeks. Um, and so we are thinking that we may be able to dose as infrequently as once a quarter after we do some initial loading. Um, and then, um, and it, you know, I think at worst it'll be once a month, but we're actually hoping for once a quarter. Yeah. So if you, I would like uh, to thank the audience for the many, many questions that are asked. We still have 23 questions open. So I'm pretty sure that we cannot answer all of them because we only have uh, one and a half minutes left. So <laughs> I, will just, uh, I will choose uh, one last question. Uh, and then if you have questions uh, for Karen, I, I, I assume that you can just uh, reach yeah, out. Yeah, so I, I have my email here. Um, feel free to, to write me. I'd love to chat some more. Yeah, so uh, well, one last question from Mike. Uh, how did you choose the dosing frequency of every two weeks? You know, we had data showing that um, we could go out to more than a month. I mean, this was all happening you know, very fast as it does in biotech companies. But, so we had data saying that it could go um, once a month. And we thought, well, at worst case scenario, if we can see this effect at once a month, the most often will dose is, is once every two weeks. For any other studies going forward, we will definitely change it to once a month. And in fact, as I mentioned, this study that we're doing with Bart Pedersen, that's a longitudinal study, we're dosing once a month. Um, and so, you know, we do anticipate that we will not be dosing anywhere near as frequently as that. But for a tox study, you want to, you know, do as much as you can. I understand. So I give the word back to Erin. Great. Well, that was an amazing webinar, especially to wrap up our summer term. Um, so I just want to thank uh, Dr. O'Neill again for giving such a great talk, for being so open and sharing your science and your details. Um, and I also want to draw your attention to uh, in early fall, in September, we have two webinars, one on the 14th, one on the 28th. Um, and then we have a webinar on October 12th. So you can go to the OTS uh, webinar page to see details about those talks. And once again, I just want to thank you, Dr. O'Neill, for your great talk today.